Welcome to How to Build a Tank, the How to Make You Successful podcast. My name is Matt Williams. I have survived the Marcus Pittman King Ginger critique, and I'm alive. I survived. I'm here to tell about it. No, I'm just kidding. Actually, Marcus's show on Friday critiquing my last show, or not the last show, but a show I did about why, how and why or not how, just why. Why we don't need another social media site was phenomenal. It was the best critique I think I've ever seen. If you haven't checked out that Law and Profits on the Fight, Laugh, Feast network, go over to the fightlaughfeast.com and check out Marcus's critique of this show. He is a really smart dude and I just love listening to him talk and not just because he's super gracious, and kind, but also he has a lot of wisdom that God has blessed him with, so praise God for him. And while you're over at the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network, go and subscribe, put in HTBT in the memo field, and you'll get this mug for free, and you'll get a ton of other benefits, and you'll be supporting shows like Marcus's and mine as we continue to proclaim the gospel in every area of life, including business. And I wanted to make one clarification based on what Marcus, is, Marcus said. We may have a future show coming, where him and I are going to talk about this more because I think he had some really great points and I think it's important for us to continue developing this narrative to the Christian community as much as possible. But I want to just make it clear that I was not doing that show in response to anything Marcus said, although I'm totally grateful that he responded to it. I was more talking to the people where I was completely, not just more, completely talking to the people that will comment on posts that talk about censorship and just say, well, we should go build our own or someone should go build our own platform. And then they kind of just disengage, don't take responsibility, don't think that they have any part to play in this battle or fight and they just want someone else to go do it. And they think it's really simple. And so that was where like it kind of stemmed, that show stemmed from. And it wasn't regards to Marcus specifically at all. Obviously, Marcus is a great warrior for Christ. He is um, a great disciple, a great evangelist, a great proclaimer of the truth. And uh, I love that brother dearly for what he does. He does a phenomenal job. And if you haven't seen his videos at city council meetings, oh my gosh, those are so good. I could just watch those all night long, just like a Netflix streaming event where you are just watching him just go after and after those council members. Oh my gosh, it's fantastic. If you have any questions, comments, you want to reach out to me, you can find me on How to Build a Tent on the social media sites, including Minds, which is the social media platform that Marcus has pushed us all to. So go check that out. Give us a subscription. Give us a thumbs up or whatever it is to like an article there. You can see me on YouTube. You can see the show live stream 12 p.m. Pacific on the How to Build a Tent channels, Facebook, Twitter. And what's the other one? Oh, Periscope. It's like Twitter, really Twitter, but it's just Periscope as well. Well, all right, so there's a few things I want to touch on today. The first one is how much is wealthy? And this article was talking about a survey conducted by Charles Schwab that said it showed most Americans believe a personal net worth of $2.3 million or 20 times more than the actual median net worth of US households would put you in the wealthy category. While millennials said it took more than 1.9 million to be classified as wealthy. So millennials think it takes a little less money. Both of them think it's several million dollars to become wealthy. And then it goes on, it says millennials and Gen, Gen, X, Z's, Gen Z's, oh, that's what's after uh, millennials, interesting. Typically spend more than they can afford in order to participate in experiences with friends. The survey found two generations also feel pressured by social media to dish out money on experiences. Now, I want to talk about this from several different angles, and there's the one angle that this talks about on its own. But the first one, I want to talk about it from a Christian application perspective. And it kind of goes with the critique that Marcus was talking about with, we need Christians with money to have a different mindset, a mind shift, a mindset. And to have a different perspective with the wealth that we have been blessed with. And I have this fear that as Christians, if we think that we are not wealthy because we don't have 2.3 or $1.9 million in our bank account, that we have no place in investing in Christian startups, in Christian companies, investing in products for the kingdom, donating um, to charities, tithing to church, and we might have this perspective that 
when I get rich someday, 1.9 million, 2.3 million in net worth or in the bank account, then I will start to do these things. But that is a problem because if you don't start doing it with the little you have, you're not going to do it when you have that much money. And I guarantee you that when you get to that point, that is not going to be enough money for you too. Wasn't it Rockefeller that was asked when he was like the Jeff Bezos of the time, right? He was the guy who uh, was the richest man in the world. And they asked him, how much money is enough? And what did he say? Just a little bit more. And that desire, that inkling for more power, for more possessions, for whatever it is, whatever kind of idol you've made your money into, uh, that will haunt you forever. And if you can't kill that desire now with the less than millions that you have, it is not going to go away when you have millions. Money does not take away the flaws in our character, the sin in our character. And I say this because we need to be engaged with whatever assets God has given us because the truth is, is we are richer than Jeff Bezos as Christians because God, the one who made everything, is our father and we are adopted into his family. I've talked about this before because it's such an important principle to understand. And one of the applications of realizing this truth that we have infinite wealth is that we can give freely. We can take investment risks because our wealth is not d determined by our bank account numbers, but it's in God's commandments to us to obey, to preach the gospel, to further the gospel as in any way that God sees fit to have us do that. So don't think of yourself as a poor person if you don't have these millions. Don't think that you don't have a part to play in supporting Christian activities, whether it's through charities, through business ventures, through the church, whatever it is, be praying about how you can most effectively use everything you have, your talents, your money, your relationships, whatever it is to further the kingdom of God. And that is what is honoring to God. And that is how we are going to further the kingdom and do cool things and come out with innovative products and compete with the secular people in this world and how they take risks and come out with great products and things like that. The second point I wanted us to address is we are spending money we shouldn't because of social media, because we see the highlights of people and what they're doing. We feel like we're missing out on life. We have the FOMO, fear of missing out. And we are making terrible business decisions, or not business decisions, financial decisions, personal financial decisions, because we fear that we're not living a life like the people on social media. Two things are wrong with this. One is we should not be trying to live someone else's life. We should be living in obedience to God. And if we just do that, then it, everything's gonna be taken care of. Two is you need to realize that that is like a fallacious argument you're selling to yourself. No one's posting, or most people don't, I guess, some might, the bad times they have or the average times they have. It's probably the extremes, right? If they do post some negative things about their life or whatever, it's like, feel sorry for me and, you know, you know, woe is me. But most of the time, it is the highlights of people's lives. And when you're scrolling through hundreds and hundreds of people that are like posting things, of course, they're going to post the great things you have. So it looks like everyone is doing a great thing all the time and you're not because you are an average person and you see yourself and you know what is going on in your life. And so you feel like you need to take advantage of and live up to like the standard of what all of your followers or all the people you're following on Instagram or all of your, all the people that you like on Facebook and live up to all of the facades that they are putting up. And it's just not true. And so please, if you are a young, young guy, young girl, and you're seeing these accounts and you feel like you're missing out and not living a life that they are living, just go to God and just, turn that stuff off and realize that they have problems, that they have bad days, that they're not living it up every moment of the day. They have to make money. They have to do things to support this life and that you will not be fulfilled even if you could live that facade life, that your fulfillment is in Christ alone. All right. I try not to get, you know, too much on a preachy soapbox on this. This is definitely about business, but I just want, wanted to let you to talk about that because it breaks my heart when so many young people 
and I guess I'm still kind of young. I'm in my mid thirties. So I'm not that young, but younger than me are devastated, depressed because their eyes are fixed on Instagram and they're not fixed on Christ. The next article I wanted to talk about is the, it lists the 10 best states for the economy in 2019. And it also lists the worst, and we'll get to those in a second. And it says that this was determined by eight differently weighted categories, healthcare, education, economy, infrastructure, opportunity, fiscal stability, crime, and corrections, and natural environment. So that must be like prisons and crimes and corrections, right? Uh, so number 10 was Arizona. So 10 is the 10th best place for the economy is Arizona. Number nine is Florida, which I move into. Whoop, whoop. 10 or an eight is Nevada. Seven, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Sorry, Boston people, if I said that wrong. Six, Idaho. There you go, cross politic guys. Number five, Oregon. Number four, California, which is amazing because wasn't California supposed to be like the number one? And like, if it was its own country, it would be the fourth biggest economy. That's like what I learned growing up in California. And now that it's like the fourth best place in the country, and I'm sure it's still like the biggest economy, but just that's interesting to me. Number three, Washington. Number two, Utah. Utah is a big tech um, uprising happening right over there. And then number one, Colorado, which is kind of the same. So those are the best places uh, for the economy, the best states for the economy, the worst. 41 is Illinois, 42 is Wyoming, 43 is Arkansas, 44 Pen Pennsylvania, I almost said Peninsula, 45 is Alabama, 46 Alaska, the 47th New Mexico, 48th is Minis uh, Mississippi, and 49th is Louisiana, and the worst state, can you guess it? Can you guess what the worst state is for the economy? It is West Virginia. I feel bad for that state. That state is like... Um, well, I've hear, I heard it. it's a really poor state. I've never been to it. Um, but there definitely, hopefully there can be ways for that economy to grow. Why do I bring this up? Well, one, it's kind of interesting. Two, if you are looking to advance your career, if you are looking to increase the value you can provide and therefore make more money in your career, then you should heavily consider relocating. And we've talked about this with regarding immigration before. We've used the example of a Mexican worker in Mexico provides less value than a, that same worker does in the United States. And why is that? It's the same worker, so it's not because of him. It's not because of his skills, but it's because the United States has significantly more capital built up, invested, and companies that could foster and use hit that worker's abilities for a greater return on their investment. And their investment is paying for them, opposed to Mexico, who has a broken infrastructure, has failing companies, it's a corrupt system, it's a corrupt government, and therefore that worker cannot make the same as he could in the United States because he moved. And because he moved to a place that had more opportunity, that had more companies and a better infrastructure that could get more value out of his work. And so he has a better life himself. The same is true for us with these different states and where there are better opportunities. So if you are looking to advance your career, if you are looking to get a, a promotion and you feel like you've been stuck or you feel like you're in a state that really isn't growing economically, you may want to consider moving to one of these best states to, uh, for the economy. Colorado, Utah, Washington, these are some beautiful states. California, I probably wouldn't recommend moving there because of their high taxes. But that is a great option. And something that I have noted before as well is especially when you are working for larger companies, international companies, one of the requirements to be promoted to climb the ladder and be in those senior level positions is the willingness to move. And so that will be a something for you to consider that I would strongly recommend is don't feel or don't just dismiss career opportunities because they are not where you are at. Be looking for 
great opportunities. It might be worth it. I mean, there's a lot of great communities out there. There's a lot of great church families. There's a lot of great Christian communities. Uh, besides hopefully where you are. I mean, if you're not in a good community, then maybe you should move just for that reason alone. Um, but moving, especially in this digital economy, moving is going to be uh, more demanded, if not just being able to remote from home. But And the last thing I'll say about it is uh, remote from home is a great option. There's a lot of benefits from it. But personally, if you want to make it to the senior levels, to the executives, you want to be working in a corporate office. And so if you are even working remotely now and you think, why would I move? I can live wherever I want and I'm happy here. I picked the place. Maybe I grew up here. Uh, if you want to build relationships with your senior executives, I think that is one of the best ways to climb the ladder in your company is to be familiar with them so that they know you. And then when those promotions come around, when those positions open up, they will have you at the top of mind and it won't be just a stranger with a resume or somebody they know over the phone or just with emails. And that is a great advantage. Another article I saw was this SoFi CEO reveals that he what he learned about millennial stock investing habits. And some of the traits that he was revealing is that millennials love to invest in companies they know, Ford, Tesla, companies like that. And then they're also, another characteristic is looking at how expensive the stock price is per stock. And that's not bad. I don't think that is necessarily a bad thing. I don't think you should be investing in a company just because you know who it is and it's you're just familiar with it. You, I think you should be familiar with the companies you invest in, but that's just the starting ground. You should also understand the industry you need to understand the market you need to understand the management as best as you can and it's not always possible not everyone has access like warren buffett does but you want to familiarize yourself and learn about the all the things that are going on i'll give you an example i heard and did some light research about hawaiian airlines and how that was going to be a great investment and I did a little bit of research, but I didn't really <laughs> research what's going on in the industry. And I took a loss on that stock because uh, recently, a few months, I think it was, it's a few months after I bought my shares, Southwest announced that they were going to go start flying to Hawaii and we brought in more commission or competition for the Hawaiian Airlines. And you know what? Their stock dropped. And then there was some. Um, fuel price issues, and a bunch of things that were industry related, not even necessarily with the company. So knowing who a company is, what they do is not enough. It's a good starting point. You want to know who you're investing in, but it requires much more. Investing is like a job. It's not just something you should passively, passively do. Maybe in times past, I think a lot of people are rethinking it or not investing at all because the just stash it away and not look at it didn't work because of the great recession. But if there were people that were paying attention and knew that the Great Recession was happening, there's a lot of people that made money after the recession during the low parts of the market and bought in when it was low and everyone was scared. And they did that because they understood their industries they were investing in. They understood the value companies. And you have an opportunity to do that too. It's not just for the elites. Now, the elites probably uh, have the best corner on day trading. You should not do day trading. That's risky and the people that do it are actually algorithms and the people that own the algorithm spend millions and millions of dollars on a whole bunch of stuff. And that's not our game as individuals, as people that aren't in New York or in Chicago. Our game is value in investing. And I was, I was talking with David about that. I was like, we're not day traders, but we're daily trading. And what I mean by that is we're not buying and selling the same stock in a day on the highs and lows and trying to make money that way, that's Vegas gambling. But we are constantly evaluating our portfolios, reading, doing research, knowing what we're, um, where our money is, what we should be selling and buying. And we could be doing, in theory, trading every day of our portfolio, but it's not the same stock. And that is a huge difference for us to understand. So millennials like investing in things they uh, no, and they like investing in cheap stocks. 
And they'll just, I will f finish this segment by saying, just because it's cheap doesn't mean it's a good value. Remember, it's the benefit minus the cost. A stock might be really cheap, but it could be like JC Penney's that's going out of business or was going to go out of business and then they're not, I guess, now. Or maybe it's like a Pier 1 Imports. Like those stocks, I don't even know what Pier 1 Import Imports price is, but I imagine it's pretty cheap. Uh, don't invest in companies just because they're cheap. That doesn't mean anything. Like you may have uh, the best value is a stock like Amazon that's what, $1,600, $1,700? Uh, stock per per stock but amazon's a great well i mean do it for yourself i think amazon's a great value every time there's a dip i want to buy more amazon because uh it's the it usually dips because uh jeff is investing more and more money into to future technology and it always usually pays off that guy's brilliant uh, so just because it's cheap doesn't mean it's a great investment and the last thing it was kind of a funny we'll end on a funny note today's show taco bell is opening a hotel and resort apparently they've done this before and it was a hit where they're really not opening a hotel from what i understand but they're actually just renting a hotel and making it taco bell themed and they're like partnering a bunch of people and i was just going to dismiss it because i realized oh they're not actually opening a hotel but then i saw this stat 165 weddings have been registered now, I don't even want to think about what kind of people would want a Taco Bell wedding or what kind of lady would get let her husband get away with that. Uh, but I brought that up because I st stopped and thought about it for a little bit and thought I would have never thought that would have been a good idea. If I had the sign off on that and Taco Bell, um, I would have shot that down. But 165 weddings, I mean, weddings are good money. And it's going to be good promotion and publicity. And I'm sure there's a lot of revenue that's going to be coming from that on top of whatever they're making for this publicity stunt. And the thing I was thinking about with this is just because at first glance it might seem crazy and a bad idea, it might be worth taking a second look and letting people actually explain themselves, maybe prove out some data, maybe look at historical events and seeing if maybe in what sounds ridiculous there might be some demand for in the market because hey if you could rent out a hotel for a month or something and get 165 weddings once a year that's a pretty good pretty good side business for taco bell uh, and especially when these fast food companies are competing more and more and finding revenue in other areas isn't a bad idea and i'm sure there are great examples in your industry of people pitching taco bell hotels quote unquote uh, symbolically for whatever what seems is crazy in your industry that might seem crazy but then actually might make a lot of sense and might be a good opportunity so don't just dismiss things outright when it's crazy take a second thought about it maybe do some investigation and hey maybe you'll end up with 165 weddings all right so we covered a bunch of stuff today i am just amazed with how how many just different news articles there are about business that we can apply to our lives there's a lot of great stuff out there and one of the reasons i love doing this show so now let us go out and be successful